Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and acknowledge Vice-Chancellor Glyn Davis, Carol Schwartz from the Trewalla Foundation, Tanya Plebisek, Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, my female parliamentary colleagues. I'm not sure if any of my male parliamentary colleagues are here. Ah, thank you, Scott. Ryan, that's wonderful. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a delight to be here because today is the International Day on the Elimination of Violence Against Women and it's White Ribbon Day here in Australia. And while we focus on the extraordinary challenges that women face in that part of their lives, it's so inspiring to be part of a launch to address the issue of the dearth of female leaders in Australia. We have come a long way and I was struck recently when Senator Maurice Payne and I attended the annual Australia-US ministerial meetings in Boston. Senator Payne, Australia's first female defence minister, and I, Australia's first female foreign minister, met with our counterparts, Secretary of State John Kerry and Secretary of State Ash Carter, and both remarked that this was the first time that either of them had met with their counterpart ministers who were females representing one country. They'd not come across a combination of a female foreign affairs and female defence minister from any other country. And so that's something of which we should be very proud. But we have a long way to go. I am pleased to say, Carol, that since you began thinking about this initiative, the number of women in Cabinet has increased. We now have five women around the Cabinet table and they bring their different experiences and backgrounds and perspective. I'm particularly delighted that Kelly O'Dwyer, who had her first child in May of this year, was then appointed to Cabinet in September and combining uh, ministerial duties and motherhood in a most competent and um, extraordinary way. On the international scene, there are a number of quite significant female leaders and in my area of foreign affairs there have been some extraordinary female secretaries of state in the United States from Madeleine Albright and Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton. In fact Madeleine Albright tells a story that when she was the first US female permanent representative at the United Nations in New York there were only seven women in those roles as the ambassador to the United Nations. And so she brought that group together and dubbed it the G7. <laughs> well, I was chatting with the Indonesian female foreign minister, Retno Masudi, the other day, and we sat down to work out how many female foreign ministers there are around the world, and there are 27. So we thought, well, we'll call it the G27, but we're just concerned that given the political cycles around the world, the volatility of politics, we might have to change that number from time to time. But it's important for women to fulfil these leadership roles because unless others see a woman in that role, they don't imagine that it's possible. And often I hear people say that, well, had I not seen Maurice Payne as Defence Minister, I would never have envisioned envisaged, envisaged an Australian Defence Minister as female. So it's important for us for a whole range of reasons, not only to be part of the decision making, to part of, part of um, having an influence on government and how we are government and policy making, but also to inspire others to imagine that they too can achieve these roles. The question of Leadership is a fascinating one. It's occupied the minds of commentators and authors um, for decades. Are leaders born or made? And I don't think we've ever um, landed on a particular answer to that. But in any event, whether they are born or made, there are always skills and techniques and um, issues that can be learned. And this is where I think this Pathways to Politics program is so vital. It is a first for Australia. Carol, I congratulate you for taking the time to 
investigate the Harvard Kennedy School of Government course, and I have no doubt that we will not only embrace it but enhance it so that this will be the best in the world. And I'm sure that there will be women across the globe who will be advocating for similar courses at their universities in their countries. Uh, to University of Melbourne, I think this is an inspired choice to include this in the School of Government. Um, Glyn, you've always been an innovator, you've always been a creative thinker, and I think that this uh, represents the kind of excellence in education that we've come to expect from the University of Melbourne. I only wish that this course had been around a number of years ago, but I feel very um, confident that the aspiring politicians of the future will take this opportunity to learn from one of our great universities in a customised course that will provide them with the confidence to consider a career in politics. I believe that the role of women uh, should be promoted at every level. In foreign affairs, I have embraced the concept of the empowerment of women as one of the fundamental pillars of our aid program, focusing on the economic empowerment of women in our region particularly, where leadership from women is so desperately needed in the Pacific, where, by the way, excluding Australia and New Zealand, the percentage of women in elected positions is under 6%. It's around 5%. So women in leadership roles, whether it be in their family, in their communities, in their business and in their governments, and of course eliminating violence in all its forms against women and girls. So they are fundamental pillars of our aid program. So in co-launching this Pathways to Politics with Tanya Plebisek, I congratulate you, Carol, on coming up with such a needed and timely innovative program and I thank the University of Melbourne for taking it on as part of their course. I believe that in years to come there will be a number of significant women leaders of this country who will be able to point to this course and say that's where it began for me. And I relate to this because it was at Harvard Business School in 1996 where I took a sabbatical um, out from my legal career and was inspired to enter federal politics during a government business and the international economy course that was taken by Professor George Cabot Lodge. And it was during, it must be something about Boston, it was during that course that I believed that there was something else I should be doing with my life, that it would be one of the greatest callings if I were to have the opportunity to dedicate my efforts and energy into the betterment of my state or my country. And that blinding insight came to me while I was at Harvard. So I hope that the inspiration that this course has received from Harvard, Harvard will likewise inspire generations of women to enter politics for the betterment of this country. Thank you.